what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. You're listening to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? And now here's your host, Neil White. Welcome to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? I'm your host, Neil White, joined as always by my brother, David. How you doing, David? Pretty good, Neil. How about you? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day for a podcast. And I got to tell this story, David, because I think this is a great story. So just around the corner from my house, there's a legion and out front they have a artillery gun, an anti-aircraft gun, I should say, specifically. So it's an anti-aircraft gun. I uh, just sitting out there and I took a picture of it and it's not a very good picture it just kind of snapped it on my cell phone and somehow you were able to actually identify the make and the size of the gun I was very impressed David I mean I just went off of the Canadian standard anti-aircraft gun caliber and model you had it figured out you dialed it in pretty good I was impressed so let's put that history and knowledge to the test again with a podcast. And to start, I'll ask you the question that I always ask you, oh brother, when art thou? Neil, it's the 18th of June, 1815. And on the field of Waterloo, two massive armies are sizing each other up, preparing for one of the great famous battles of world history but where i am we're over in vienna the capital of austria at the same time and even as a french army and a british army are preparing for what will become the most famous battle between those two nations in history one man the count talleyrand has the job of explaining to the great and powerful of Europe that France and Britain are not at war. This seems counterintuitive, David. Even I have heard of the Battle of Waterloo. It's, like you say, a very famous battle. How could it be that the French and English are not at war? Well, the question hinges upon who you consider to be the French government. Because as Mr. Talleyrand would be happy to explain to you, Mr. Napoleon leading the French forces is nothing but a rebel, a lone, rogue, independent madman who's doing his own thing with no sanction from the French government, who are royalist and peaceable and want to be involved in the peace conference then ongoing at Vienna, and not this army marching to an epic confrontation with destiny and two of the most famous generals in world history at Waterloo. I've heard of Napoleon too. So David, set the scene for us. What was the world like in 1815? Well, to set that scene, we've got to go back quite a ways actually. But luckily, we can follow most of the important developments by following Mr. Talleyrand, who is going to be our most important character of this podcast. Okay, so who is Talleyrand? So when he's born, he's the second son of a powerful French noble family. And because he's the second son, he's not going to inherit. So his parents decide he should have a career in the church. And by the time he's 20, he's a bishop because when he's born in the 1700s, the French nobility is powerful, and if you're connected, your career is going to be a rise straight to the top. But Mr. Talleyrand is at the very end of the 1700s, perhaps unfortunately for him, and his meteoric rise in the church is suddenly interrupted by a little thing called the French Revolution. A lot of French nobles end up getting their heads cut off in that one, right, David? They do, but not Mr. Talleyrand, who, even though he's young at this point, has a sharp eye for politics and recognizing that things are not going well for the nobility very 
early on, well before most people have recognized that something's going wrong, he switches sides and becomes a spokesperson for the moderate wing of the pro-democratic revolutionaries, which helps him to avoid the whole reign of terror and that unpleasantness and continue on. But with the Catholic Church in France having serious problems with the new democratic government, which is no fan of the Catholic Church, he ends up having to leave his position as a priest and a bishop and go into government service instead. So he goes from the church to the public service. Indeed. What's he going to do now that he's not a bishop? So he moves into the French Department of Foreign Affairs, essentially. So he becomes a diplomat, and very quickly, because there's not a lot of experienced diplomats available to the French at this time, right after the revolution, he very quickly becomes a senior figure in the French Foreign Service. This is the point in time, just as an aside, that he accidentally starts a war with the United States of America. Oh, that's not really something you want to do, usually. He was demanding some bribes from the American diplomats who were coming over for, you know, diplomatic reasons, and the Americans get angry about it, and then he lies to the French government because he doesn't want to admit that he was demanding bribes. So then the French get angry at the Americans, and it becomes a whole thing. As I've said, eventually they declare war on each other, but this is still the tail end of the 1700s. Neither the Americans nor the French really have the naval power to get across the Atlantic to fight each other, so it all fizzles out pretty quietly. Luckily for Talleyrand, of course, always embarrassing to be too tied to these things. Is this the kind of guy he was, David? Demanding bribes, kind of grifting on the side? It's more grifting at the center of things. Talleyrand is not a guy who does his grifting on the side. But yes, he is absolutely... Well, he's a guy who's willing to switch sides at the drop of a hat, and he's also a guy who likes to make sure he gets all of his own personal comforts. Let's put it that way. I see. So where does he end up after this, David? Well, at this point, even as he's heading up, the French government is undergoing dramatic changes as the revolutionary government that led the reign of terror led by Robespierre is itself overthrown for its excesses by a force of concerned individuals who would prefer a more moderate sort of government, at least in terms of the number of people being executed on any given day. They form a new government called the Directory, and almost as soon as they formed it, Talleyrand is joining up and supporting them and getting promoted, which lasts for a little bit, and then a young general by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte ends up rising to the top ranks of the French army and having his own problems with the overcautious and frankly incompetent directory and finding himself being reached out to by Mr. Talleyrand, by this point the head of the entire French Foreign Service, who like I've said, is very good at telling which way the wind is blowing when it comes to these political changes. So when Napoleon himself launches his own coup, becomes first director of the French Republic and then emperor, Talleyrand is right along with him, coming along for the ride as a foreign office head. Boy, David, I can hardly keep up. So he was in the church... Then he joined the revolutionary government, then he joined the government that replaced them, and now he's in Bonaparte's government. That's right. So he's now in his fourth government, the second where he's the head of the foreign service for France, and this is really where he starts to get a lot of experience as a diplomat because Napoleon is at war with basically everybody. He's at war with Britain, he's at war with Spain, he's at war with Austria, he's at war with Prussia, he's at war with Russia, he's at war with the Danes, he's at war with the Dutch. What I'm saying is he's got a lot of wars going on. When you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. When you're a general, every country looks like a war. 
Exactly. And when wars end, as they must, somebody needs to write out a peace treaty. And that is Talleyrand's job. And initially, things are going great for Napoleon's armies. They're winning everywhere, and Talleyrand is just writing up the peace settlements they're going to impose on Europe, and it's all great, fun and games. But then Napoleon invades Russia. Never start a land war in Russia, David. It doesn't go so great, as you may have heard. And suddenly, Talleyrand, with his skill for seeing which way the wind is blowing, is looking around going, time to jump ship from this government and figure out who is going to be the next government of France. Classic Talleyrand, classic Talleyrand, already ready to jump governments. But of course, it's never quite that quick or simple, and there's another couple of years of epic war, the famous Battle of Austerlitz, the Battle of the Nations, as the Prussians call it. There's a wacky kidnapping plot that Talleyrand will mastermind and in some sense personally lead, involving running across three different borders and a wacky affair in Belgium. But this all calms down to Talleyrand realizing the only plausible replacement French government for Napoleon that will at all be French is to go back to where he started, back to the monarchy. So he finds the most powerful claimant to the French throne and signs up. Now he wants to be the head of foreign affairs for a royalist government of France. But the royalists aren't as sure that they want him as he's sure that he wants them. Have they perhaps noticed that he's been a part of a lot of governments? He's been a part of a lot of governments. Many of those governments have been ones at war with the French royalists, which is another issue for them. But he's got one card. It's not a great card, but sometimes you just got to play what you got. And the fact is, nobody wants to be the head of foreign affairs for a new French government after Napoleon, because that sounds like a terrible job. Are they afraid of having to clean up Napoleon's messes? If by messes, you mean the fact that every country in Europe is at war with them and wants to to get something out of the peace treaty, that's exactly right. But Talleyrand is willing to do the job? Talleyrand is willing to sign up. And that's what leads us to Talleyrand getting final permission to be the new diplomat for the King of France and packing his bags and heading to Vienna because that's where the great powers of Europe, Britain, Austria, Russia, and Prussia have agreed to have their conference to determine how they're going to deal with all of the issues left behind by the two decades of war with revolutionary France and then Napoleon's France, which are now hopefully finally coming to an end. So Napoleon's still fighting. He's still got the big battle of Waterloo left, but the rest of Europe is already getting ready to move on. Is that the case, David? Well, you have to remember that Napoleon... Sorry, I forgot to mention this. Napoleon has surrendered and left for exile. He's been sent to the island of Elba. He's packed up. He's supposed to be gone, done with. Now they're having a conference. Talleyrand is heading for Vienna because he needs to represent France's interests at this conference when nobody else likes them. But his issue is that this is a conference, as I've mentioned, between four countries, Russia, Prussia, Austria, and Great Britain, and France isn't one of them, and Talleyrand isn't invited. Talleyrand is not the only guy gatecrashing this party. Practically every country in Europe that wasn't one of the four that are holding the conference has sent somebody to Vienna to listen in, 
to find out what's going on and to, you know, sort of represent their interests. But for Talleyrand, that's not good enough because France might be in a bad way depending on how these four powers are feeling. So he needs to be involved in the decision-making in the secret conferences, which means that he needs to convince these four countries that did not invite him to let him become a part of everything. So he decides to start talking to everybody but the four countries he needs to convince. This seems counterintuitive, David. It is counterintuitive, but it's actually very clever. You see, Talleyrand realizes that he's not the only guy hanging around Vienna on an official diplomatic mission who wants to be involved. And he realizes that his position is weak, but that's maybe not true of every country hanging around. So what he's looking for is somebody who's not currently on the inside, but who's important enough that if he starts to make a fuss, the big four will have to let him in, that he can sort of attach himself to and come in with. And he finds, hanging around Vienna, the Marquis of Labrador. The Marquis of Labrador. David, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that in 1815, this isn't someone from Newfoundland and Labrador. No, the Marquis of Labrador is the most important Spanish diplomat of his day. He is the official personal representative from the King of Spain to this Congress. And he too is kind of ticked that he's, you know, on the outside, not part of the secret meetings. But he's also important because the King of Spain has connections in the Austrian court and in the British court. So when he starts making a push, inspired and helped by Talleyrand to get inside, the big four have to let him in. But when they do, Talleyrand makes sure that his name too is on these invitations. So he manages to get his way inside. So he's finally managed to break in to be part of the conference to be important. Everything looks like it's going well. So of course, something goes wrong. Just when things seem to be going well, something always goes wrong, David. Like sometimes when you're recording a podcast, you have to stop halfway through because someone's phone breaks. But what goes wrong for Talleyrand? So in this case, it's not a broken phone. Instead, it's Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. He sneaks out of Elba, goes back to France, rallies the French army to himself rather than to the king, who theoretically they're supposed to be serving, raises the banners of the empire, and marches north to seek battle with the English and the Prussians, who are in Holland at the time, but who are the closest of the allied armies to France. And for Talleyrand, this is bad because he's trying to sign a peace treaty with both England and Prussia. So suddenly finding out that they think they're at war with him, it's not great. Yeah, that's a little bit awkward. He's sitting there ready to sign the peace treaty and Napoleon is taking his country back to war. Does this bring us, David, to the 18th of June, 1815? That brings us back to the 18th of June. 1815. Napoleon's army has marched, it's reached Waterloo, the English and the Prussians have fought earlier epic battles to get things into place. Now the question of whether Napoleon or King Charles will control France is about to be put to the issue between Napoleon and General Wellington on the field of battle. And what is Talleyrand doing back in Vienna to try and get out of this tricky situation. Well, Talleyrand is focusing again away from his immediate problems. He's reaching out to Russia, to Austria, 
because those are the two countries that aren't currently involved in the fighting so they're the ones who maybe aren't as angry at him um as the other two but then the battle of waterloo happens napoleon gets captured and the congress of vienna gets back on track there were some interruptions when you know the whole war thing restarted but they're getting back on track and talleyrand suddenly finds himself switching again from the russians and austrians who had seemed earlier to be his natural allies because they're not currently at war with france back to the English because the English have a weird issue driving them away from their other allies. They don't want to kill Napoleon. Why not, David? They just fought a war against this guy. You know, at that time, wouldn't it be a natural thing to kill the enemy you've defeated? That's definitely what everybody else thinks, and they think that the English are crazy. But there's a method to that madness. The English view Napoleon as a symptom of a greater issue, a war with France that is driven by the fact that France views itself as perpetually surrounded by hostile powers. And just getting rid of one guy won't fix that. It needs a bigger, deeper fix. And they don't particularly want to execute Napoleon just for kicks. So if it's not going to achieve anything, they want to just send him into exile again to St. Helena in the South Atlantic. But Talleyrand realizes that this gives him a chance because now there's a split developing between the Russians and the Prussians who most view this war in personal terms and want to kill Napoleon specifically, and the English especially, but also to a lesser extent the Austrians, who view it as being part of the people's will, a broader problem, and who are willing to negotiate with Talleyrand to try and actually change the circumstances of France so that there can actually be a lasting peace. So the diplomat has a new dancing partner, so to speak. He's going to negotiate with the English. And a lasting peace is kind of what he wants too, right, David? Isn't this a great opportunity for him to maybe actually get the sort of peace treaty that he wants? It is. It's an amazing opportunity. And the result, dramatically, will be a triple alliance. A new and unexpected player on the European scene ending decades of war by suddenly splitting the old alliance and forming a new one. Well, I don't see any way that could go badly, David. Give it a hundred years or so. Okay. <laughs> but Talleyrand is still Talleyrand. So even as the Triple Alliance and the Treaty of Paris are being inked up, Talleyrand is taking this chance to go out to all the little countries that he initially sounded out at the start of the Congress looking for a chance to get inside in order to tell them that all of their issues, they can have a chance to get them on the table, so to speak, get them heard by the Congress, which is really a good idea that helps to make this a more stable and lasting peace. But of course, there's a price. And that price is going straight to Talleyrand's pockets. Ah, so he's got a side hustle. He's always got a side hustle, but ultimately this will be his last great side hustle of a long diplomatic career because after this triumph, Talleyrand will be retiring to more or less obscurity. It'll be the young bucks of the conference like Castlereagh for the British or... Metternich for the Austrians, who will be the next great diplomatic team of the 19th century. 
But what a career for Count Talleyrand, starting out as a bishop, working his way through government after government, accidentally starting a war with the U.S., a kidnapping plot in Belgium, dealing with Napoleon, writing peace treaties, and then ultimately finagling his way into the table at the Conference of Vienna and creating, really out of nothing, a brand new alliance that changes the shape of Europe. And being wildly corrupt all along the way. It's a great story. Thanks for telling us, David. Always happy to tell these stories, Neil. And we hope everyone will tell a friend about the podcast. If you're enjoying it, spread the word. We appreciate it on social media at When Art Thou or our website is obrother.ca. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. David, we like to end the podcast with a quiz. And this week I have a which came first. Very simple. I've got two things. You've got to guess which came first. Make sense? All right. Hit me. All right, we'll start off with a fairly straightforward one here. Who was born first, Alexander the Great or Aristotle? I would guess Aristotle. You would be correct by about 28 years. Aristotle was about 28 years old when Alexander the Great was born. All right, David. Next question. Again, fairly straightforward. Which came first, the elevator or the telephone? I would guess the elevator. And you would be right. It was invented by Elisha Otis in 1852. The telephone wouldn't be invented until 1876. Okay, David, which came first, Tyrannosaurus Rex or the Stegosaurus? I'm honestly not sure. I'll guess the Stegosaurus. Again, you are right. Three for three, David. You're killing it here. The Stegosaurus came first in the Jurassic period. T-Rex lived much later in the Cretaceous period. And this is what blew my mind, David. This is a fun fact. The T-Rex actually lived closer to our own lifetime than it did to the Stegosaurus. So that gives you a sense of the time that we are closer to the T-Rex than it was to the Stegosaurus. Wild. Okay, question number four. Which came first, the founding of the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan or the establishment of municipal council for the city of Madrid in Spain? Apologies for my pronunciation there. I'm a little rusty on my Aztec. I am honestly not certain. Perhaps I'll guess the Municipal Council of Madrid. Four for four, David. You've got it right. Madrid received its charter to regulate the Municipal Council from King Alfonso VIII in 1202. The Aztec capital wasn't founded until a century later in 1325. Last question for you here, David. Which came first, Hinduism or the Great Wall of China? Whew. We're going way back on this one. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, certainly. I'll take a guess on the antiquity of Hinduism. Well, exact dates are a little hard to nail down here, David. But Hinduism emerged from a synthesis of many religions around 500 BC to 200 BC, while the wall started when earlier fortifications were connected by the first emperor of China around 221 to 206 BC. So Hinduism had the earliest start of the two. Five for five. Great job on the quiz, David. It was good fun, Neil. And thanks for listening.